information. So in the sense, they can only talk about, they can only identify the green bonds and brown bonds outside of all, and they cannot tell which one is green firm or which one is brown firm. And because of this information friction, that's where the model becomes interesting. So that's the uh, main background information. And let me formally address the research question of the paper. And it's simple. First, we want to price, oh, sorry. First, we want to know how to price the green bonds and then relatedly how to evaluate the level of greenwashing. And finally, we want to see how the carbon taxation or say the transition risk affects the green bond pricing and the greenwashing level. And as a conclusion, because it's a simple model, so we can have an analytical result on the green premium, which is a green bond premium, which are depend on uh, the premium exists when there are asymmetric information, transition risk, and greenwashing cost. And the greenwashing level, or say the threshold, depends on the premium, additional cost, and the greenwashing cost. And finally, we can find that about the carbon taxation accountable. When the carbon taxation is low, the level of greenwashing is low, the premium is low. However, when the carbon taxation is high, carbon tax is high, these are not symmetric. So the level of greenwashing and the premium are uncertain. And for detail, I'll show later. So that's the basic summary of this paper. And uh, for the literature part, well, as you can see, it's a pretty hot topic. So all the literatures are published in recent five years. So we have two main parts. One is theoretical parts and empirical part. For the theoretical part, uh, we focus on two main parts of literature. The one is green asset pricing, famous one like Kessler and others, and Harrison and others. And uh, a lot of paper, basically all of them, they are showing that the green assets should have a lower expected return. Why? Because they have green preference and physical risk. And in our paper one, we want to prove that the premium exists without the green preference. And I'll show you why. And the uh, second part is about the climate policy. So specifically about this carbon taxation. The famous paper is Giartini and others in 2021. And a lot of paper they are using the environmental DSG model and uh, a main conclusion that a big and sudden move of carbon taxation will have a threat on financial stability. And in that part, we have a minor conclusion saying that a small and swift carbon taxation decreases brainwashing. As I, as I mentioned, when there is a big carbon tax, we are showing that the result is opposite. And finally, we have some theoretical literature on uh, adverse selection and uh, signaling literatures. And the interesting part is in the empirical literature, although this one is an empirical, but uh, a theoretical paper. So first, you can see so we want to provide some theoretical support for the green bond pricing related issue, and specifically we want to focus on the information asymmetry. And second, we do not have any exogenous ESG preference to explain the green bond premium. So why we don't include ESG preference? For one thing, I mean, in my own opinion. Well, investors are quite rational. I mean, rigorously rational. They sometimes, I mean, sometimes they maybe don't care about the environmental effect. So under such conditions, how the model looks like. So that's a motivation for the paper. And similarly, as you can see, a lot of theoretical uh, literatures are focused on the physical risk, for example, the temperature increase or climate catastrophe. And the empirical literatures are difficult to distinguish which risk they are reported. And mostly they are reporting the physical risk because they are talking about the exogenous risk, uh, exogenous shock on climate and the issue. But in my opinion, these kind of physical risk or like this long term catastrophe or temperature, they are the risk in the long term, maybe in five years, 10 years, 20 years later. But how about now, for example? That means how about the transitional risk, which is the policy risk, or you can see the carbon taxation possibilities. And in that sense, what happens if we don't talk about the fiscal risk and only talk about the transitional risk, only talk about the policy related risk in the near term? So that's a part. And lastly, as a result, in this paper, we try to explain two different empirical findings, both with premium and without premium. And uh, we try to quantify the greenwashing level and discuss its effect on green bond pricing and the carbon taxation effect on both greenwashing and the green bond pricing. So that's what, what I think is interesting in this paper. And uh, for now, that's all for the introduction part. And 
I'll go to the setup. And uh, by the way, if you have any questions on any cl clarification about these models, please interrupt me anytime. So for the setup, it's simple. So we have the firms, the bond issuers, and uh, sorry, uh, the investors as bond buyers. Because it's an adverse selection model, so the firms have private information. They okay. So first, let's say some sim simplification rules. So firms are they are risk neutral. They borrow to produce. They have limited liability. And the firms would divide into two types: green firm and brown firm, as we mentioned in the first page. And the type are private information. And here, one thing I need to say that we do not make it complicated in terms of the production. We only use AK model and the A is exogenous given. So it's like the externality related issue or the green technology improvement, green innovation issue is out of the scope of our paper. And for the emission related, the green firm has zero emission, brown firm have emission intensity follows uniform distribution and the financing method, they can only issue bonds, the green bond or brown bonds. And after production, the firm chooses to repay or default. And for the investor side, it's even simpler. So they are risk neutral. They can invest in green or brown bonds. They only observe bonds type, not firms type. So because of that, they have to have a no arbitrage uh, condition, meaning the expected return of green bonds and brown bonds should be the same. Otherwise, uh, one kind of bond market will disappear. So that's the agents. And now let's briefly talk about the bond setup. So for bonds, the brown bonds and green bonds, there are only two types. Brown bonds, given rate is RV, which is exogenously given. And uh, green bonds, the R, given rate RG is the key of interest. And the, additionally, as you might remember, we have a lot of additional attached for the green bond. So the green bond additional issuing cost CR, which is exogenously given, is a parameter. And the green washing cost we denote as FEI. EI is a emission intensity as a function of green washing cost. And as you can imagine, this is quite intuitive. This cost is increasing and continuous and convex function of EI because I mean, the higher emission intensity, the harder they need to disguise their like emission behavior. Right? And lastly, let me briefly talk about the transition risk, the only risk in the model. And it comes from the uncertainty around the carbon taxation. And for why is risk? Because the government, we assume the government implement the carbon tax after bond issuance. Because if they issue before the bond issuance, it's not a risk, it's just a co additional cost for the for the green uh, for the brown firms. So for this specifically, we assume the carbon tax rate is tau with probability p and no carbon tax with probability one minus p. And uh, this carbon tax is exogenous in the model. Again, we are not focusing on the externality in the ring related literature because there are a lot already. And uh, for the timeline of the model is simple. We only have a one period model for stages as we just saw the, the first stage, the green brown firm issue green brown bonds. Second, the investor choose to buy the green or brown bonds. And then the transition risk is realized whether there is carbon tax or not. And lastly, we say uh, the result realized. So they, the firms repay or default depending on the firm's emission and uh, the carbon tax, the transition risk realized. So, now, after we talk about this whole story, I want to talk a little about the strategy of both green firm and brown firm as a first step. And as a second step, I'll try to talk about the no arbitrage condition in the green bond market and brown bond market. So in the first step, for the green firm, oh, sorry, it's simple. So it's, if they want to issue green bonds, the issuing cost is RG plus D bar. And if they want to issue brown bond, that's just RB. So for the threshold of green firms issue green bonds, it looks like this. That's just the cost is lower, that's why they issue. Additionally, for green firms, the carbon tax is relevant because we don't have carbon emissions in green firms. So whatever the transition risk is realized, it doesn't affect the green firms uh, strategies. And for the brown firms, it's a bit complicated. So as, as similarly to the, uh, the green firms, the brown firm can issue green bonds and brown bonds. And if they issue green bond, they need this cost. So coupon rate plus the additional issuing cost plus the greenwashing cost. And if they issue brown bonds, that's just the coupon rate. So as you can see under each strategy, we can divide it into the tax scenario and no tax scenario. 
And under each scenario, there is possibility of repay or default based on the emission, carbon emission intensity. So as you can see, uh, the wrong firm strategy finally depends on the two main factors in the model. The first is carbon tax rate, and the second is carbon emissions. And intuitively, as you can imagine, the wrong firm with low emission intensities, they try to issue green bonds because the greenwashing is cost is quite small. But if the emission intensity is high, they will just keep themselves to be in the brown bonds area. And with higher emission intensity and higher carbon tax rate, the brown firms are more likely to default because they need to pay more for carbon tax repayment. So to formally address the brown firm strategy, uh, we need to focus on these two main characters. So one is carbon tax rate and another is carbon emissions. And uh, how to divide these two factors. So we use the carbon tax rate as the main character and divide into three cases. Case one is baseline tax, how equals to tell at. And case two is lower tax, case three is higher tax. And under each case, we have a chart. So as you let me explain the chart first. So as you can see, the horizontal line is the emission intensity, and the vertical line is the expected profit of from firms. So as you can see, the green curve is for green bonds and for the black line is for brown bonds. So basically, as you can see, the green ones are the greenwashing, the reflection of greenwashing, and the black ones are just the brown firms issued by the brown, the brown firms issued brown bond. So you can see why this first case is a special because all the turning points coincide with each other. So how to interpret this? It means when the emission intensity is small, is smaller than this E1 hat, it means the brown firms issue green bonds and they will repay under tax scenario. And when the emission is bigger, that means brown firms issue brown bonds and they will default under tax scenario. So that's how it's interpreted. So let's do it again the exercise. So for case two, as you can see, it's similarly uh, or, but the turning point is kind of everywhere. So as you can see in the first area, when the emission is small, the green, the brown firms issue green bonds, so the green curve, and they need, they will repay on the tax scenario. And in the middle between the E2 hat and the E2BT, as you can see, the brown firms issue brown bonds and they will repay on the tax scenario. And the last day is a wrong firm issue wrong bond that will default on the tax. So that's how we characterize the wrong firm strategies based on the carbon tax rate and carbon emission. And for the third part, I'll just skip because of the time constraint. But if you're interested, we can come back to this later. So that's how we define the uh, brown firm strategy. So that's all for the strategies of firm design, the false brown firm and green firm. So at the second step, let me briefly talk about the bonds market. And as you might remember that we need to have this no arbitrage condition inside the green bond market and brown bond market, because we have the risk mutual investors. And if, the, if we want to make the green bond market and brown bond market coexist, we need to have this expected return for green bonds market under the case N equals to the expected return of the brown bond market under the case N. So let's go case by case. So remember, in the first case, we have a special tax top hat. And under this case, in the green bond market, of course, green firms choose green bonds. So that's the share of green firms. The RFL market share times the overall amount of the firms. And for the brown firms in the green bond markets, so that's, we can call it a greenwashing firms. And they have these amounts. So one minus alpha is the market share of brown firms and its overall amount of firms. and uh, E1 hat is the threshold of greenwashing. And as you might remember, as we can see here, all the green bonds will repay under all kinds of scenario. That's, that means that there's no default for green bond market under any circumstances. That means the expected return for the green bond equals to their coupon. However, for the brown bonds market, as you can see, the brown bonds market, they have the rest of brown firms issued in the brown bonds and there's no tax under no tax scenario there is no default under tax scenario everybody default why because as we mentioned here that's a special case so if they have the brown firm brown bonds that will default under tax scenario so based on these two 
steps, we can find out the expected return for the both brown bond and green bond. And based on this uh, condition, the no arbitrage condition, we can find out the final RG. So this is the key of interest, the Q parameter of the green bond. So that's how we do the calculation. And for the detailed calculation, I'll skip. And similarly for case two and case three, we have the same decomposition of green bond market and brown bond market. And we calculate the expected return for both green bond and brown bond. And we have this condition. So what does this condition bring us? I can show you the result. So for each cases, we can have an equation. Let's still take case one as an example. For this case, as you can see the first line and I reorganize it a little bit. So the left-hand side, so being the green bar, as you can see, it's R1 G star minus RB. What is this? This is actually the spread of, between green bond and brown bond. And actually, in other words, this is called green. Bond. That means whether the green bond has a discount on the coupon rate or otherwise, whether the green bond has a price premium. So what does it equal? So it equals to the right-hand side, so this part. And similarly, for the case two and case three, and it's just getting more and more complicated. And what does this right side, the blue box, means intuitionally? And because we only have the transition risk in this model, so transition risk is the only risk, so we say it's the premium equals to the risk premium. So what kind of risk it is? Actually, it is default risk, and uh, I'll show you in the next slide. So as you might wonder that this conclusion is a bit messy, so instead of directly talking about this conclusion, I will try to use some applications to get some interpretation of this conclusion. So the first conclusion, or so the answer for the research question is, does the rhenium exist? And we say it exists, but under some conditions. Again, so the rhenium actually is RB minus RG. And as long as RB minus RG is positive, that means rhenium exists. So when does this positive, we say it depends on three requirements. First, information asymmetry between firms and investors. Second, the positive greenwashing cost. And the third is the transition risk. Okay. So for why there's premium exist? So briefly speaking, it, it is like a lemon market. So why? Because the brown, brown bond issuers are brown firms with high emission intensities. And for this brown firm with high emission intensities, they are likely to default on the tax scenario, which means that, that they are more likely to default and they have more loss during a default when a default happens. So that's the existence condition for premium. And also we can have some additional interpretation for the case where the premium does not exist. So basically the counterpart of uh, these three conditions. So for first, if there is no information asymmetry, that means it's a perfect information setup, then we don't need premium because we don't need signal because everybody knows everything. The investor can directly invest in green firms and grab all the possible profit they can get. And the second possibility is when there is no transition risk, meaning the probability of carbon tax implementation, the P, is either equals to zero or one. And for why this case happens, because when the no transition risk, the green bonds and I'm sorry, the green firm and brown firms have the same default risk, there's no risk, then we don't need the green. Yet. Lastly, is when the greenwashing cost is zero, that means the green bonds have no values as signals. In that sense, the green bond does not have any value added, then the green is zero. So that's the first application. And for the second application, is the uh, answer for the second research question is what is the level of greenwashing? And in the model, we have a very simple uh, equation about brown firms, one to issue green bonds and one to issue brown bonds. So let's talk about the issuing cost. This is the cost for brown firms issuing green bonds, and this is cost for brown firms issuing brown bonds. And for the greenwashing threshold, of course, it's left hand side equals to right hand side. So if the left hand side is bigger, for a specific EI, then the brown firms choose to issue green bonds. That's what we call greenwashing. So the threshold satisfies this criteria. One thing to note here, because this RG is exogenously decided, so it decides it by a lot of parameters. So it's hard to explain what's exactly this in intuitionally. So what I what we want to focus on this is this function of the greenwashing cost and the yeah, the function of greenwashing cost, the F. And uh, we can see that when the 
when the spring washing cost function is steeper, that means this one is bigger. That means the overall the E hat will be smaller. That means the green washing decrease. And for the real world implementation, sorry, the implementation, for example, there's a detailed guidance on information disclosure that can make the green washing cost steeper or a catalog of green business or a constant monitoring of green business after bond issuance, which can make the green washing cost steeper. So that's a second application. And for the last application is the answer for the last research question is about the effect of carbon taxation on the green yam. And as I mentioned, the green yam actually equals, to, oh, sorry. The green yam actually equals to the default risk premium. And if we decompose this default risk premium, we can say it's a difference of average default probability between green bond and brown bond times the average, the difference of average loss when the default happens between green bond and brown bond. So actually by the equations, we can draw the charts of this both probability of default and uh, the average loss of default as below. So let me explain the charts. When we denote the horizontal X as the carbon tax level and the vertical X, the left hand side is probability and the right hand side is the average loss and the black one is brown bond and the green one is green bond. And this tau hat is the baseline scenario, so the case one. So as you can see on the left hand side, between zero and tau hat, that is case two, which we denote as a low tax scenario. And uh, the right hand side case is the high tax scenario. And as you can see, as we see this tau hat as a baseline, so when the carbon tax is lower than the tau hat, so the difference, so the so the distance between this black line and the green line is getting smaller and smaller. That means the difference between the average default probability is getting smaller when the tax goes left hand side from the tau hat. And similarly, the average loss is getting smaller and smaller when the tax goes on the left hand side from tau hat. So when we combine times these two together, that we can say that the medium is lower than the baseline under uh, the lower tax case, so case two. And similarly, when we talk about the case three, so the high tax case, you see the problem, the difference between probability is getting smaller. However, the loss between the two bonds is getting bigger. So you see one is getting smaller, one is getting bigger. So the overall default risk premium, well, we cannot say it's uncertain which one dominates each other. So that's the uncertainty we're talking about. So that's the carbon taxation, and uh, that's basically the main part. So let me conclude. As you can see that we find the premium exists under three conditions, one asymmetric information, transition risk, and greenwashing cost. And we can quantify the greenwashing level in the model and decide by these three conditions. And finally, we show that the carbon tax when the carbon tax is low, the greenwashing is low and the premium is low. However, when the carbon tax is high, the greenwashing and premium, the level are uncertain. So for finally, for the policy implications, we are trying to see that the government plays a crucial role in the existence of green bond market because we need the government to generate the transition risk. And we need a lot of governments to have a unified taxonomy and also the compulsory information disclosure requirement decided by the policy maker. And lastly, we want to suggest that uh, the government should use constrained green subsidies instead of general green subsidies in order to uh, reduce the green bond issuing cost while increasing greenwashing cost at the same time. So that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yung Gao. And this paper will be pre discussed by Darwin Choi from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Darwin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so thanks for asking me to discuss this very interesting paper by Yun and uh, her co-author Schisman. So we are looking at, at a very important market here, the green bond market. So I'm pulling these data from the Climate Bonds Initiative. We see an upward trajectory from 2014 to 2021. So last year, 2021, the total issuance uh, is over 500 US dollar, 500 billion US dollars. Okay, so and uh, this is also separated by region. So Europe was the most prolific issuance region, but Asia Pacific experienced the strongest annual growth last year. Okay, so you also see Asia Pacific has been like growing tremendously. So I think this part uh, fits the conference very well. So CEPR strong in Europe and a rising Asia. 
Now, of course, a lot of papers look at green bond premium, but the empirical evidence is mixed. So some papers said, yes, there is a green bond premium. Some, some papers said, no, there is no premium. And some people even document a green bond discount. So um, there are some arguments. Um, usually, they argue that there should be a green bond premium. So for example, this is a signal for the firm's climate change commitments. And also, uh, some other papers uh, assume that investors prefer green assets. Okay, So not just green bonds, but it, this could also apply to stocks and other assets as well. Now, this paper here by Yuan and uh, Shishman can theoretically explain a positive green premium or zero premium. So um, kind of like reconciling the conflicting evidence. So here in particular, the premium depends on the transition risks and the transition risks come from the uncertain carbon tax in the future and also come from a costly uh, greenwashing activity. Now, if these two are missing or if the information asymmetry is missing, then there is no premium. So a particular feature I want to highlight again and again here is it does not require a preference for green bonds. I think this is a really cool idea. Of course, you can assume there is a preference, then you generate the premium. But here, this paper tells you, even if there is no preference for green bonds, you can still have a green premium. OK, so that also helps us, as Yun said. Right. So the thing about like we think investors care about financial returns. So I am sure a lot of financial investors, they actually don't really have a preference for green assets. So some people, they prefer ESG assets because they think ESG assets do better. Okay, so, but if this is not true, then uh, uh, a lot of these assumptions don't hold. So this paper is particularly cool by saying that we don't need a preference for green bonds. Okay, so, but at the same time, we can still generate a positive green premium. Okay, so to summarize in one slide, so the paper de delivers uh, a, a, a simple one period model. So a simple but elegant model delivering important results. So here the information asymmetry uh, regarding firms uh, em uh, emissions exists between the firms and the bond buyers. Okay, so the firm emissions levels are private information to the firm, but the buyers do not know. Green bonds provide a signal of firms green credentials. The value of the signal depends on the transition risk the extent of greenwashing, and the greenwashing also depends on the cost of issuing green bonds and the cost associated with greenwashing. Now, there is a small extension of the model into a three-period model uh, in the paper that provides policy implications. So there, they uh, 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 analyze the timing of the carbon tax, so whether the carbon tax um, should be uh, quickly introduced or uh, should be uh, introduced with a delay. Okay, so they uh, compare the two situations and argue that the carbon tax should be introduced quickly. Okay, so um, now, of course, the paper is written very well, model is elegant, simple, but deliver an important result. Now, I would like to push the authors further uh, by offering some comments to try to help. Okay, so my first question is, I am challenging the assumptions. Okay, so here, the paper looks at the firm's emission level. So the emission level per unit of production. So this is similar to the carbon intensity that people use empirically. So like emissions divided by revenue or emissions divided by assets. Okay, so this is like emission level divided by uh, a function of the firm size or the firm's production. Okay, so here there are only two types of firms, green and brown. So green firms has emission level uh, per unit of production equals zero. Brown firms has uh, the emission level uh, 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 uniformly distributed between zero and one. Now the paper assumes that green firms always issue green bonds. Brown firms issue brown bonds, but they can issue green bonds if they are greenwashing. Okay, so here this is a key assumption. Brown firms that issue green bonds, they are always greenwashing. Now I challenge this assumption uh, by looking at the data. Okay, so is it true in the data? Now I tried to look up some data and in fact, I found Schichman own working paper. So Schichman uh, and Cha, 2021. Um, so where they have the data. So where they look at the green bond issuers. So this is the green bond issuers versus the long green bond issuers. Uh, distribution of the emission intensity. So the uh, CO2 emissions divided by the revenue. Okay, so in different buckets. Now, um, they argue in the paper 
green bond issuers are greener. Okay, so which is true, right? So we, when we compare the dark blue, dark, dark green bar, they are usually more to the left, right? So when the emission level is lower. Now, if we just split the graph into green firms and brown firms, let's say by the median emission level, and from Bolton and Kapachik, the median emission level is about 33. So you will be somewhere here. So 25 to 100. So you see, to the right of this median, there are a lot of brown firms that issue green bonds. Okay, so of course, some of them may be greenwashing. Okay, so, but there are really a lot of brown firms issuing green bonds in the data. Okay, so although it is true that green bond issuers are usually greener, a lot of brown firms are issuing green bonds. Okay, so we also see that by industry, so there are uh, 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 many green bond issuers come from high emission industry like utilities, industrial, energy. Okay, so of course these can be some clean energy, they might not be brown firms, but I assume there are some like brown firms here in these industries and also among these issuers. Okay, so now let's take a step back. Well, so what exactly is a green bond? So green bonds most distinctive feature is the use of proceeds, right? So the proceeds waste by the green bond sales should be earmarked for green projects. Now, unfortunately, there are not universal acceptor standard what exactly is green project, what is exactly green bond, um, but there are these uh, principles, the green bond principles established in 2014. Um, these are voluntary uh, best practice uh, from the Climate Bonds Initiative, this GBP, so green bond principles, do not provide details on green. The green definitions are left to the issuer to determine, uh, but they do provide some guidelines, some suggestions. So broad green project categories suggested by the GBP include the following. Uh, energy buildings, transport, these are mostly high emission activities, uh, water management, waste management, pollution control, agriculture and forestry, uh, industry and energy intensive uh, commercial. These are mostly high emission activities. So I can imagine a brown energy firm issues a green bond to make their production process cleaner. Now in my mind, I don't think this is greenwashing, right? So this is really a brown firm trying to improve by issuing green bonds and use the green proceeds uh, to, to make them greener, right? So, and then, so to my mind, this is not greenwashing. Now, um, I also um, checked their paper. So they also have a graph looking at the uh, change in the uh, emission around the green bond issuance. So this is Schmidtman and Cha uh, again. Um, so this shows that green bond issuers become greener after issuance, right? So, 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 uh, 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 same as um, people usually expect. And of course they can check the data where the green firms and brown firms behave differently. So they can look at the high emission firms where the, the high emission firms also uh, 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 reduce emission intensity after issuing green bonds. They can check in the data. But my sense is um, I am suggesting that they alter their framework slightly. So instead of classifying firms into green and brown, I am suggesting an alternative classification based on good and bad. And I cannot come up with better names. I just named them good and bad. And if you use these, you can uh, even preserve your notation. They are still, still G and B. Okay, so good firms, they improve emissions. So the negative change in emission levels. And bad firms, there is a positive change in emission levels. Okay, so these are almost identical to the current framework except that now the change in emissions is where the information asymmetry is, right? So the changes in emission is private information to the firm, but unknown to the public, unknown to the investors. Here, however, emission levels can be public information, which I think match the data more closely. A lot of firms disclose emissions levels now, okay? So, but the change in emission uh, that only the firm knows, okay? So this is private information. Now, in this framework, good firms issue green bonds only, so they know they will reduce carbon emission, they, they use the green process to, to, to reduce carbon emission, but bad firms, they can do greenwashing, and they can issue green bonds, or they can uh, issue brown bonds. Okay, so here, up to here, up to this point, this is very similar 
to the current framework. So I think they can translate their current framework into this easily. Now there is one problem though. One problem is that the carbon tax that they look at is applied on emission levels. So firms with high emission levels as in currently will go bankrupt. So not the bad firms go bankrupt here. So actually the, uh, 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 the brown firms will go bankrupt. So a brown firm, despite being a green, green uh, uh, a good firm, the brown firm, if they, uh, even if they decrease the emission level, they can still go bankrupt here um, in this new framework. Now I have a simple fix for this. So um, to again, stick closer to their original framework, maybe they can introduce a long zero carbon emission quota in period zero. And when the carbon tax is introduced in the future, then the carbon tax is applied on the emissions above the quota. Okay, so then um, this will also be closer to the current framework. So then the bad firms will go bankrupt if the uh, 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 change in the emission is too large. Okay, so if there is a really uh, a large change, a positive change in the emission. Okay, so that this will be closer to their current framework. Okay, so you guys can think about it. Now, uh, my Second comment is on the three period model. So you didn't have a chance to go through the details. So in their last section, they develop a three period model to analyze the timing of the carbon tax. But after a carbon tax is imposed in period one, firms need to disclose their emission level, right? Because the emission level is tied to the tax and the emission level is public after period one. Now, um, and there is no asymmetric information anymore, right? So in that multi-period model, uh, 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 in the middle, the, the information asymmetry is removed. Now, what they assume in the model is, uh, because some of the old brown firms drop out, then they assume an equal number of new firms enter into the market. And these new firms, uh, people do not know the emission level. So, so, so the information asymmetry only exists for the new uh, entry firms. Okay, so this is the current assumption. Now, coming back to my suggestion, if they classify firms based on changes in emissions, um, that has an additional advantage. So, so that I think would work better in the multi-period model too. Okay, so because here, firm types in future periods can be different from firm types in the previous period and can still be private information, right? So for example, a firm could, can be good in period one, decreasing emissions, but bad in period two. The change is still private information, right? So last period's change doesn't tell people about future periods changes, okay? So the, a firm can be good in the past, but bad in the future, the firm types can change. Um, so uh, 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 then they don't need to assume um, the new information asymmetry coming only from the new firm. So even for the old firms, the information asymmetry is still there, even if the emission levels are low, right? So because the future emission changes are unknown still. Okay, so they can think more about this model. And I think they can also um, probably develop more features for the three period model. So one other thing I was thinking is the authors can also explore, right? So if a firm is greenwashing in period one, so these are the bad firms in period one, they issue green bonds, but they are exposed to the market. So the market knows, so they get a bad reputation. So maybe the authors can consider banning them, banning these bad firms from issuing green bonds in the future, right? So of course, in the future, they can become good firms, but because of their past greenwashing activities, maybe they should be banned from issuing green bonds. So maybe there is some interesting dynamics to analyze there, right? So when they issue brown bond, uh, sorry, when the bad firms issue green bonds, when they do greenwashing now, they have some future consideration, right? So if they uh, uh, get exposed, then they do not have access to the green bond market anymore. Okay, so I, I encourage to, the authors to explore some of these in the multi-period model. Now, uh, again, to summar summarize, this is a very, very interesting paper and uh, uh, delivering very important results, does not require a preference for green assets. This is uh, totally new to me. Uh, I do have a suggestion on like, how to classify the firms uh, uh, in the model. So maybe classifying based on changes in emission will better match to the data uh, because what well, emission levels are almost public information now, so lots of disclosure now. And uh, brown firms, if they are improving emissions, they are probably not greenwashing. And this also has an advantage in the three period model, right? Because um, you can preserve the information asymmetry. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Darwin, for stimulating uh, uh, discussions. Um, I'd like to give the floor, uh, react, uh, Jung, the floor to Jung Gao. She can react shortly and then we have open discussion. 
thank you very much, Darwin. Uh, okay. And uh, well, thank you very much for all the suggestions. On, uh, <laughs> for, for all the suggestions uh, that you promote, provide. Yeah, of course, for the definition of the wrong firm and green firm, then I have to admit, admit that we try to simplify this whole model. So we'll make it maybe too simple. And as you mentioned, the uh, Johan's paper about like the the green firms that sorry the brown firm that trying to do some green activities indeed is a problem based on the model interpretation. And thank you very much for the idea about doing the change related like definition like the negative uh, change in emission become a good firm and positive changes become a bad firm and definitely we'll try it on that. But there might be some concerns because we, as you have already seen that when we talk about the original brown firm strategy is already very complicated. As you can see, we have two main factors and there has a lot of, I think over 10 kind of classifications. And if we further include these changes and the original level of this uh, group green bond firm or brown firm related emission related issue, then the classification might be, I think, multiple maybe 40 or 50 kind of possibilities and that just will make the results really complicated but of course i'll try and i i just think of a very simple uh idea about like uh we can combine like the current structure was uh, what you promote and maybe we can have like the uh, the zero emission was positive change, zero emission was negative change, and uh, positive emission was positive change, positive emission was negative change, and only focus with the four case. And I mean, if you're interested, we can talk in detail later and give us some time constraints. And secondly, thank you very much for the three period model uh, related explanation. And actually, the reason I didn't include in this paper is because we find that the three period model doesn't really have a lot of value add, value added. And you promote a lot, and thank you very much. And we'll try to work on that. And um, if there's anything interesting showing up, and of course, we'll add the three period model back to the paper. And I'm sorry to send you the old version because we just realized three days ago. So thank you very much. And that's all for my uh, reply. And if you have any questions on the floor, yeah. Is there anybody who likes to raise questions, give yeah. comments? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm now a little bit confused about the uh, definition of uh, greenium uh, because I know several empirical papers, and I think uh, many papers, uh, most papers, analyze municipal one, yes, not corporate one. And uh, also, uh, you know, usually municipal issue are both green bond and standard bond. And the empirical papers compare the premium of the standard bond and the green bond of the exactly the same issue. So I think the definition of green is totally different from the definition of green in this paper. So uh, I'd like to know, you know what do you think about this? Well, 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 maybe if I get to introduce. Uh, ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to make it to Karen and Mashti. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor. Um, uh, first of all, yeah, I have to say this paper is about the corporate bond, and we don't talk about the sovereign related bond. And as you mentioned, if we talk about sovereign bonds, that we have to talk about an externality related issue. So, how to fix how to improve green technology and how to reduce the carbon taxation, et cetera. And if we talk about that, we have to incorporate the green preference in the sense. So it's it's not a firm behavior, it's already if government is included that I mean it will make I think that's another paper, indeed. And uh indeed we're interested and uh, for further about the sovereign bond related premium, I think we'll look into that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I also saw, thank you very much. I saw a, a hand from Kashu, Kashu Hiko. You had a question? Yes. Uh, I have a quick two questions. Thank you very much. I, this is Kazuo Hashi from Hitotsubashi University. And uh, that's a very inspiring paper. I, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I have two questions. First is uh, uh, actually related to the uh, question that is made now. Uh, uh, if you introduce the uh, risk free bond, 
and you assume the uh, risk uh, risk neutral investor, then the you know the return should be equal to the uh, expected return should be equal to the risk free rate. So uh, does it change the uh, uh, you know the result of your uh, model? And the second question is that uh, you mentioned as a policy implication about the uh, subsidy that changes the uh, uh, cost of green washing. But I wonder if you formally uh, investigated the change in the cost of green washing in your paper and uh, what will be the result. Thank you. Anyway, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And sorry, can I can I hear your first question again? So it's risk. Oh, okay. If you introduce a risk-free bond, then the expected return of the you know the brown bond and green bond should be also equal to the uh, risk-free rate, right? So uh, then, uh, if so if the, uh, the introduction of risk-free rate affects the uh, result of the uh, theoretical model. That's I my see. first question. So the risk-free, ah, I see. So kind of like the international interest rate related issue. So I think basically in the paper, as you can see the, as as you can see the brown bond, or you see the regular or conventional bond, the, the bond rate RB, we say is exogenously given. And actually that depends, that is decided by the, no, I mean, that is closely correlated with the risk-free rate. So suppose the risk-free rate increase, then the bond rate will increase accordingly. And uh, I think that's how, I mean, if we want to introduce a risk-free rate, that's how this risk-free rate uh, affects the model. But I think as, yes, like the results still hold in a sense. Did I answer your question? And uh, for the second one is about the subsidy, so the greenwashing cost. So the greenwashing cost actually comes from uh, uh, the adverse, adverse selection layer literature. So we kind of introduced the signal and the signal is costly and it's not perfect. So how to identify this imperfect signal? And uh, actually I have, I have another paper with Professor Weida to talk about this costly imperfect signal under a different context. And if you're interested, I mean, we can talk later and I can share with you the document. And basically how to characterize this greenwashing cost where uh, assuming, actually assuming that as the emission rate increase, the greenwashing uh, cost will increase. And this increase in the first order condition is also increasing. So like as the emission rate is getting bigger and bigger, the difficulty of doing the greenwashing is getting higher and higher. So that's how we justify the greenwashing cost. And uh, for the related literature, I don't think that we have something in the green finance related issue, but we have a lot in the uh, the bank screening related issue, like in case of the signal literature. <laughs> so that's my answer. I yeah. hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Uh, Any I have a uh, comment and a uh, question okay. around the, all the previous questions. Okay. Um, so one is the definition of the bond return, RB and RG. Yeah. Is it uh, expected return after taking into account the default bond, or is it the coupon? Coupon. Coupon. Rate. coupon rate. Okay. Yes. Now, my question. So that's good because when you look at the data in the empirical study, usually we what we see is the coupon rate instead of expected return. So uh, that's good. Now, my question uh, is, uh, I'm a little bit also confused about the definition of greenium and uh, especially relationship between greenium and the asymmetric information. Probably my thinking is stupid and wrong. So please tell me what's wrong with my reasoning. Um, so when there's a asymmetric information, um, you know, bond investors, so suppose, you know, cost for signaling is not enough to remove all the asymmetric information and still some asymmetric information is remain even after signaling. Then bond issuers, bond investors will be cautious about the green bond. And uh, in that case, green bond 
price will be discounted so that the premium between green and brown yield should be smaller with an asymmetric exchange. But the result is actually opposite. Only when asymmetric information exists, there's a green premium. And if the information is perfect, there's no premium. So I tend to think sort of opposite. If the information is complete, then I would a clear demarcation between green and brown. What, what's wrong with my? Yeah. So can I ask you a question oh. first? <laughs> Yeah, so like under perfect information, uh -huh. why do you think there's a premium? So uh, because it's a coupon rate, right? So the, yeah, so the expected bond is different. So uh, bond investors taking into account expected the loss for the future after getting a tax and so on, and the brown would have a low expected uh, cash flow. So that's, uh, yeah, that's my reason. I see. So it's like, so under perfect information, we already know who is green firm, who is brown firm. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like for green firm, they will charge directly to green firm, not green bond. So you say, so you don't really have a model for no a perfect information. Perfect information that you say, okay, in the perfect information case, there's no bond. I mean, there there is bonds, but it's like the Just a single bond. Uh, it, it can be different. Okay. Depends on the productivity of green firm and brown firm. And actually, in the paper, we have a perfect information like that. This hypothesis case in in the very beginning, and we can show that there is no premium. And the reason is because, uh, I can give you a simple example. So suppose so now we only have the AK model, right? And suppose the green firm has a higher productivity. So the green firm, so A for green firm is bigger than everybody, every investor just go green firm and uh, they their return, I mean, the coupon A or the return is just equals to A. They can get every money they can get. And the brown firm will just exit the market because nobody <laughs> invests in them. Okay, so, thank you. I'd like, I'd like to move on over to two more questions. Beatrice, you have a question? <laughs> Beatrice? Yes, uh, good morning. It's a, okay. it's a really interesting uh, paper. Beatrice Leda Di Malo from uh, uh, University of uh, uh, Graduate Institute Geneva and CEPR. Um, I, um, uh, I also, like, uh, like Darwin, was uh, impressed by a model that gives us a greenium without any kind of uh, preferences for green bonds or ESG investing at all. Um, and, uh, and and I like really the elegance and sim well, <laughs> apparent simplicity of how you of how you present the results. But one thing is I'm still confused and I may have missed it um, is uh, how much is this whole green bond market introduction actually contributing to lowering emissions here? Can you say something about it? Or are there any reductions in emissions? And if so, through what mechanism exactly? Um, and the second question I have is uh, the, uh, the, the introduction of the carbon tax is, is the main regulatory uncertainty here and the, the thing that is uh, exogenously either coming or not or high or low. And um, of course, the, the, in, in principle, this, uh, and I think that's partly also what we observe in the, in the, in the reality, um, this may be endogenous, whether authorities have the courage uh, to introduce uh, carbon taxes or not, uh, may depend on the structures that are not only on the, uh, in the real economy, but also in the financial economy. So, the, so, um, so I, I'm wondering, I'm not suggesting that you introduce this in the model, but I think some discussion around that because the, the carbon taxes are obviously um and a very important regulatory intervention but one which is very much on the question these days or only at a very low level thank you you go yeah <laughs> thank you very much and actually these two questions just <laughs> point to the very disadvantage of this paper so for the first one um about how does the green bond market affect the emission and uh uh, I forgot if I mentioned in the presentation that we, in this paper, we do not talk about 
any externality regarding to the emission. So suppose we want to talk about how to reduce the emission, then we need to talk about the production technology, like to improve green and reduce carbon, uh, I mean, reduce the GHG emission. And actually that's the second paper that we are trying to start a proposal and trying to include this production technology inside this paper, uh, I mean, inside this literature. And Unfortunately, in this paper, I have to say that we do not have any uh, implication about how to reduce emission. So that's your first question. And for the second question about the transition risk, whether it is endogenous, well, I think if we talk about the endogeneity of the transition risk, then we need to include the government inside the model. And currently, we only talk about the, I mean, the firms and investors, so it's kind of, we don't have a really big, I mean, general environment that set up. And uh, for your advice, and thank you very much. And we'll try to combine both this endogeneity of transition risk and also the externality on the emission about the production technology into the future work in the sense. So that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamun, you had a question also. Sure, thank you. Thanks, please. Uh, sorry, it's more, it's more like a comment. It's a very interesting paper. It's a very innovative. So what which I thought was some kind of a you know first insurance bond insurance mechanism seems to play a role. Like think about in corporate or sovereign bonds, right? Technically, the first guys that actually came is going to have a facing a big risk, right? But if it's sort of experiences matter, they you know sort of market actually learn. Technically, credit rating rating agency or the investors in general learn the experiences, you know, to, to differentiate those which is stable guys and non stable guys, right? So it's kind of this mechanism, like a learning mechanism could be interesting to consider. So one aspect of it, like, you know, because you don't have I mean, like data that doesn't exist, which is there's no particular firm that I share bond yet. So it, it could be sort of a complement by first bond insurance in particular market or something that, that could help in some regards. Yeah. Uh, and also like, you know, it could be interesting to consider got some learning, like a market is gonna learn these experiences and you try to capture like a size economy. This is going back to the previous discussions comments and some, something like sort of a scaled economy is actually comes in once you establish a threshold, right? That we you should differentiate. So that could be two aspects could be considered. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Then I, I'd like to round up this first session. Uh, I see from the program, we have a uh, uh, coffee break for now 50 minutes. Uh, so we convene again in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, we, we, we convene again in 10 minutes. See you all then. Take care.